Hello, uh, hi to everybody. Mm -hmm. I will just try to uh, share the screen. So yes, thing and see, uh, go on. My name is Laurie Lepik and I'm currently working as a senior researcher at the uh, Estonian Institute of Population Studies at Tallinn University. In recent years, I have worked uh, at the intersection of social protection and population studies, mostly dealing uh, with topics uh, which have both uh, a social policy and population dimension and obviously this has motivated the choice of my topic for this for this lecture. Uh, there are two parts of, of the presentation. I will firstly attempt to generalize a bit uh, some of my experiences in this field and the second part as the as the format requests uh, I, I refer to some results from the studies of recent years where I have been a co-author <laughs> along with, with my colleagues. Um, the general aim uh, of social protection policies is to offer protection by means of uh, services and benefits against a set of social risks. Um, most commonly, uh, these risks are old age, disability, unemployment, care needs, social exclusion, and others. Um, these are situations which occur with certain frequency in the lives of people and involve either loss of income, additional costs, uh, or otherwise um, undesirable uh, burdens and, and consequences. Um, social policy analysis mostly attempts to address then or, or examine the impact of, of such policies both before and answer, after or ex ante and, and exposed. On the other hand, uh, population studies uh, analyze people's demographic behavior, uh, such as birth, migration, health and death. And population policies aim to impact uh, the size and structure of the population and to address the consequences of, of demographic change. The intended aims are generally good <clears throat> and the ambitions are often high, uh, while the results <clears throat> are not always so impressive. Uh, the two uh, policy domains uh, frequently meet uh, and there is a complex interplay between the population and social protection, which involves both common agenda and intrigue. And, and that's the reason why I have titled the presentation um, accordingly. One of the topic, <clears throat> one of the topics in the common agenda is certainly inequality or, or rather inequalities. Um, reducing inequalities by means of redistribution of resources uh, and provision of public services is a core agenda in social protection. And the effectiveness of, of social protection policies is frequently measured in terms of to what extent such policies reduce inequalities, poverty and social exclusion. On the other hand, in population studies, the socioeconomic status gradient or, or SES gradient is a very frequent angle of research in attempts to explain variations in social demographic phenomena. Studies on, on health inequalities or studies linking a rising uh, inequality in life expectancy to social economic status can be referred to as examples. But <clears throat> the topic of um, inequalities is also causing at least some intrigue between the two policy domains. The population studies uh, which scrutinize on the SES gradient often end with a call 
for more effective social policies to reduce such inequalities or uh, with warnings about the possible side effects of certain so, uh, social policies, such as uh, raising uh, the pension age, which uh, many countries undertake uh, to adjust to the population aging. A common source of intrigue are also high expectations to the other policy domain, which are expressed either in two general terms or uh, which, are, which the other domain has difficulties to meet due to constraints, which are not always recognized. The toolbox of social policies has a limited set of instruments and not all failures can be fixed with, with these. But there are also social policy expectations which population studies and policies frequently fail to meet. Obviously, the population is the basis of all social policies and specific groups of population form the target groups of social protection schemes. Population studies can help describe the objectively measurable characteristics of the target population, but this not, does not suffice to build uh, functional and effective uh, social policies. For a number of reasons, uh, the dominant a uh, qualitative approach of uh, population studies is one of the shortages in this respect. The inability to factor in the expectations, motivations, uh, behavioral variations points to the still weak area in population studies. But uh, the subjective perceptions, value positions, preferences have a high relevance in several areas of social policy. We can take child protection, disability, rehabilitation, uh, long-term care services as, as examples. Um, there, is also, there are also some common challenges which in a way uh, bring uh, these areas together. On one hand, <clears throat> There is a challenge of value fragmentation, a process of, of increasing heterogeneity in the value positions of contemporary societies and formation of rivaling uh, value-based communities. This is a common challenge for both social protection systems and population studies and policies. A process labeled as value fragmentation is a challenge uh, for social policy, among others, because it calls into question the principle of, of universality, which has been one of the cornerstones of the welfare state in the past. And in turn, if universalist policies are rejected, um, uh, inequalities are likely to persist or, or even increase. The two partner <clears throat> policy domains have also somewhat different pace. Social policies, at least those uh, which cover large groups of population have been accused of, of inertia. Large interest constituencies attempting to maintain <clears throat> the status quo. While this, uh, this process has been commonly labeled as, as path dependency. However, as the practice reveals, uh, despite this path dependency, there are windows of opportunity and at least some areas of social policy exhibit quite high dynamism. Uh, on the other hand, the pace of population change is generally much slower than policy change. Population change is generally measured <clears throat> over cohorts and generations rather than by yearly fluctuations pointing here to the limitation 
of, of period indicators in demography. So one co any one cohort is, is likely to be affected by several changes in sectoral policies, including social protection over their life course, uh, albeit <coughs> such changes may occur in different time periods of, of their lifespan. Population change is also one of the factors frequently triggering social policy change. Um, I refer here to uh, a book uh, from 2000 by, by Ferreira, Hemerick and Rhodes, who use the notion of policy recalibration to capture the institutional reconfiguration and rebalancing uh, uh, as, as acts uh, to attain, so to speak, goodness of fit between the welfare state and socioeconomic reality. And the, the <clears throat> population or, or demographic aspect can be regarded as, as, as one dimension of, of this reality. Um, so population change may be regarded as, as one of the factors which over time erodes uh, the congruence <clears throat> between policies and, and the socioeconomic reality and creates a mismatch between the supply and demand side for institutionalized welfare. However, as this erosion of the goodness of it is always gradual, the timing and the way how it will be addressed by means of policy reforms is likely to vary across countries. Broadly speaking, <clears throat> there are not too many ways or approaches how to mitigate the effects of population change on social protection policies. There are quite limited uh, principal op options to neutralize the fiscal effects of population change. Uh, there are examples of such policies, um, such as demographic buffer funds used in the public pension schemes in, in some countries like like Sweden, but uh, these buffer funds then aim to neutralize the effects of differences in cohort size. Um, but the, the widespread use of similar buffer funds across other sectors of social protection is both unlikely and even questionable. The other principal approach uh, is to adjust social policies to accept uh, the population change evolving and accommodate policies to the changing circumstances. Also from the field of, of pensions, there are examples such as automatic balancing mechanisms like linking pension age to life expectancy, but in many other domains such adjustments and accommodations are still mostly ad hoc one-off policy reforms. And adjustment to population aging remains one of the key policy challenges in the current era. Indeed, um, at times there are either calls or, or warnings uh, on a third type of, of approach, which is to adopt uh, population policies um, to impact the population structure. And I refer here to two, um, in a way, two approaches or, or two types of policies from the opposite uh, ideological um, corners, um, pronatalist policies to increase fertility and uh, migration policies to increase current labor force. 
these are clearly uh, value-laden propositions with quite different effects, uh, both in terms of, of time horizons and, um, and in terms of, of, so to speak, barriers, uh, which uh, these approaches may have, um, either in short or, or longer term. In all cases, irrespective of the approach taken, some questions um, remain. If, if governments adjust policies, do people adjust their behavior accordingly? Uh, do they respond to the new policy incentives? Are they able to adjust? Are they willing to adjust? Or rather, who will respond to policy changes and who will adjust and who will not? Either for not being able to, for example, due to health constraints or deliberately maintaining other preferences. The behavioral change uh, or behavioral adjustment is likely to be heterogeneous. And indeed there are and will be always distributional effects of policy adjustments. Um, on the example of Estonia, we can, we can see this currently evolving uh, on the example of the recent pension reform in Estonia, which has allowed individuals to utilize their pension savings before reaching pension age. The response to such a reform varies but even those who take a similar action uh, by withdrawing their pension assets uh, uh, do so uh, with quite different motivations and also uh, with different consequences. Um, actually, one question has struck me um, uh, and I'm not <clears throat> in a position to give a good answer yet. <clears throat> So it's, it's a, a kind of rhetorical question. If aging is a consequence of some behavioral and cultural shifts in societies in combination with some behavior, in combination with, with health advances, would people adjust their behavior to cope with the consequences of aging or What are the grounds to believe that, that they will adjust? Um, there are also other challenges. Um, one of them concerns the difficulties to measure the impact of policy changes. To disentangle uh, the effect of policy changes from possible confounding factors in an evolving social context remains a tricky issue. <clears throat> and even if some modeling approaches offer potential analytical tools, um, it um, remains a major challenge to decompose the role of various concurrent in influencing factors, both in the field of population studies as well as in the area of policy analysis. So even though um, over the recent years, um, the requirement for ex ante impact assessments has become a standard uh, before policy reforms are adopted, um, such studies rarely seem to be able to estimate all short-term and long-term impacts across all related areas. <clears throat> there is certainly an avenue for pilot studies, uh, but in the field of social policies, it very, very seldom there is a possibility for a controlled clinical trials uh, as in the medical research to measure the treatment effect of, of a particular policy before it is administrated. 
at a large scale. Hence, um, many policy reforms still remain, if I may say so, uh, large scale social experiments uh, with impacts and mostly just some aspects of impacts assessed ex post. Uh, Ferreira and others to which I referred earlier have conceptualized this with the notion of, of re-experimentation. Uh, search for novel policy solutions, uh, policy innovations through new institutional settings, open for policy learning and, and policy draw and lesson drawing. Uh, however, such an experimental approach is inevitably prone to possible mistakes and hence its adoption presupposes the acceptance of possible failures. In turn, this involves difficult ethical di dilemmas as what is at stake is, is the welfare of, of people. Um, now, um, in the second part, um, I will <coughs> refer to some <coughs> of the recent um, studies uh, mm, the first area <coughs> concern pension age reform um, and here we have published um, there are two papers <coughs> I will mostly uh, speak about the the first one uh, published quite recently in the Journal of Pension Economics and, and Finance, but this was a follow-up of an earlier paper from 2015, uh, which broadly concerned um, the same matter, but uh, using different um, analytical approach. Um, so the the question, the key question in this um, in this study was how did women whose entitlement to an old age pension was postponed because of pension age reform? So over the study period, uh, the pension age uh, was increased for, for affected women by uh, two and a half years. Uh, how these women responded to this policy change? What were the effects on, on employment? So, so this analysis used individual level administrative data of the Estonian Pension Register and applied difference in differences estimation strategy. I will um, I will refer just to some of the main findings from this study. So here we see the the lines describing the affected cohorts of women born from 1944 to 1950 and uh, and age specific activity rain, rates and the change of of this these these rates uh, in the context of of pension age increase. So we observe both postponement uh, of exit from the labor force, which is associated uh, both with with normal pension age and with with early pension age. So, um, so here for the normal pension age and, and here for the early pension age. Uh, and from the modeling um, with difference in differences, uh, 
strategy, we observed that increasing the pension age did keep uh, affected women longer in the labor force, but the reform accounted for a relatively small part of the overall increase in activity rates in Estonia, which um, could be observed over the same time period. So about slightly over one third of the change in activity rates could be associated uh, or linked to the increase of the normal pension age. And also, <clears throat> compared to the findings of uh, similar studies from other countries uh, which have undertaken pension age reforms, the estimated uh, increase in the employment rate of affected women appeared uh, relatively small in this international comparison. So uh, why this study is and was relevant? So it is one of the common policy responses to policy, to population aging to, to increase the pension age with the purpose to mitigate the fiscal consequences of, of aging on pension expenditure. However, the pension age reform will achieve these aims only if the affected cohorts are both able to and are willing to adjust their labor market behavior accordingly. In other words, if the question is if the policy change will trigger a change in the labor market behavior and whether the affected cohorts will work longer. We did observe that the reform did have an impact, but um, the fact that this effect was relatively small comparison with findings from other countries suggests that um, the institutional context where a particular policy reform and change takes place plays um, a major role. In the Estonian context, uh, the factors we can point out are low replacement rate of pensions compared to previous earnings, combination, the possibility to combine pensions with earnings from work, lack of disincentives, uh, tax disincentives, in the context where um, we already have high employment rates of, of older persons, in fact, some of the highest in Europe and, and the highest among the pension age population, that, um, that in such a context, um, to undertake a pension age reform um, does not have the same magnitude of, of impact than, than a similar reform in, in other contexts. Um, the second um, fairly recently published paper concerns um, material deprivation of, of older persons. Here, we studied the individual risk factors of material deprivation among older persons aged 50 and over from a cross-national comparative perspective. And the questions um, analyzed were, how does material deprivation among older persons vary according to social demographic risk factors. Um, the factors analyzed uh, included age, gender, education, economic activity status, household type, number of children, residential area, chronic diseases, limitations of uh, daily activities, and, and then origin. And another question concerned how do the relationships between material deprivation and social demographic risk factors vary between groups of countries with different welfare regimes. Uh, 
So um, shared data from the survey of health and retirement in Europe uh, were used uh, in this study and uh, material deprivation was, was measured uh, by the material deprivation index um, constructed uh, on the basis of, of um, questions in the share survey um, relating to uh, dimensions of, of material deprivation. So 15 share countries were clustered in to four welfare regimes, um, Nordic, Western, Southern, and Eastern, and logist logistic regression models were used to assess the odds, odds ratios of material deprivation for each independent variable, or socioeconomic uh, risk, uh, social demographic risk factor. Um, <clears throat> We firstly observed a pronounced variation in the material deprivation among the older population across these four welfare clusters with particularly high levels of, of material deprivation in the eastern and, and southern clusters. Uh, but secondly, we observed that in all clusters, um, living alone, having large number of, of children, having low education, activity limitations, and being of immigrant origin significantly increased uh, the risk of material deprivation in old age. Um, for southern and eastern clusters, additionally, some risk factors uh, um, I appeared uh, significant, uh, such as being uh, 80 and, and over years of age, or, or being a rural resident. Um, so these increased the risk of, of material deprivation in these clusters, but not uh, in the Nordic and, um, and Western clusters. Uh, so this finding uh, appears to uh, suggest um, that uh, the way the welfare regime operates um, plays an important role in respect of material deprivation in later life, albeit in, in some types of welfare state more than in others. We can also observe from, from Eurostat data that the cross-country variation in the material deprivation rate of older persons in Europe considerably exceeds uh, the respective variation among um, active age and, and child populations, which is an observation which um, also appears to suggest that um, the welfare state may have a higher role in buffering the risk of material deprivation of older persons compared to uh, the other age groups, um, indicating that um, older persons rely more on social protection systems than, than other age co cohorts, which um, is not surprising, but um, still worth taking note. Um, we are currently continuing uh, with uh, a follow-up study attempting to shed um, some more light uh, on the role of the welfare state on material deprivation of, of older persons, to what extent the main social protection schemes uh, mitigate uh, the risk of material deprivation. Again, based on shared data, mm, but this time, mm, using multi-level analyses, uh, attempting to assess the links between material deprivation of older persons and the set of macro drivers, including measures reflecting the institutional features of the welfare state, such as uh, spending on the main social protection schemes, which 
are relevant for all the population, um, like health, um, old age, disability, and um, social exclusion and housing, as well as measures um, on wealth and income distribution. So this is an ongoing project um, and um, the article is still to be written, but it's a work in progress. Um, and um, the third topic um, I will speak concerns longevity of of a group of World War II veterans. Um, here um, we published uh, with Alan um, last year an article in demographic research um, and um, this was a follow-up on, on an earlier version published in Estonian language uh, in a historical uh, historical journal Tuna uh, for English speakers. <clears throat> I'll just uh, mention that this uh, journal is not about fishery uh, but, uh, but about history. <clears throat> uh, but um, the title translates poorly to, to English so therefore the original title of the journal is is, is used here. Um, in this study, um, we used uh, biographical uh, data or individual level life histories of um, um, over 3,300 Estonian men who served as volunteers in the Finnish army during the Second World War. Mostly these are men uh, from birth, birth cohorts um, 1918 to 1925. And uh, we analyzed differentials in longevity among um, these men in relation to their uh, life course in the post-war period using uh, Cox proportional hazard regression uh, models. Um, why this group is uh, particularly interesting. We know that um, most Estonian young men during the Second World War served either in German or German army or in the Red Army, in the Russian army. Um, so compared to these um, two other um, groups of, of World War II veterans, uh, the volunteers who served in the Finnish army uh, was smallest, but there are some features which make um, this group uh, particularly interest, interesting um, uh, uh, to study. Mm. Among others, because uh, the war and its aftermath divided uh, them into several distinct subgroups uh, in a way that re resembles a natural experiment. Some escaped escape to exile and lived in uh, Western countries. Uh, some lived in, for the largest part, in Soviet Estonia and were not repressed. And a third group lived in Soviet Estonia and were severely repressed, uh, either imprisoned, sent to labor camps or, or executed. Um, so <clears throat> young healthy men who survived the war followed distinctly different life course patterns after the war. This setting allowed us to analyze the impact of macro-social environment on longevity, um, shedding some light on the one hand about the long-term impact of extremely inhuman conditions of Stalinist repressions on longevity, and on the other hand, uh, also on the East-West mortality cap, which is um, 
one of the common themes in mortality um, studies. So <clears throat> we observed um, that uh, the group uh, of men who settled in the West uh, exhibit the highest mean age at death, um, 71.9 years, um, which exceeds um, by, by three and a half years, uh, the men who lived in Estonia and were not repressed uh, um, and significantly increase, uh, um, exceeds the, the average lifespan of, of men who were repressed. We observe here, <laughs> firstly, a strong immediate effect of repressions. Um, the, there were many who did not survive labor camps, some who were executed um, due to repressions. But we also observe a cumulative effect of the Soviet life, not immediately after the war, but some 40 years after the war, after the socialist rule. Uh, <clears throat> so looking at the hazard ratios in interaction with, uh, with calendar periods, so here we see that the direct effect of repressions was very high. Uh, and later here, mm, so-called regime effect appears, which then increases the, the hazard ratios of dying some 40 years after the socialist rule. However, we also observe um, that um, there was a subgroup of um, those who survived repressions uh, exhibiting above average uh, longevity and um, the hazard ratios of dying of these repressed men are lower um, than for those who were not repressed. Uh, from mid uh, from mid nineties. So, and this leaves uh, some different possible ways of interpretation. This could be either due to selective mortality, to put it very bluntly, survival of the fittest, uh, substantially increased. Um, institutional support um, after the regain of, of independence by Estonia from early 90s, um, which constituted the regime's change, but um, the formerly repressed persons received uh, rehabilitation and pension supplements. Um, or finally, the third possibility to interpret this result is resilience, that uh, which could be characterized by a colloquial saying that what didn't kill made some stronger. We are not able to distinguish between these mechanisms uh, as they work in the same direction and um, we have no data to sort of test out uh, which of these mechanisms pr prevails. Um, in a currently ongoing follow-up study, we analyze how the World War II and its aftermath affected the family formation of the same men, in particular partnering and, and having children. And although the results are yet to be published uh, uh, and the work is still in progress, um, I can reveal that uh, the group of men who lived in exile, uh, while they lived longest, the same does not hold uh, as regards the average number of children of, of this group. So migration appears to have a toll on the family formation. Now um, concluding, um, as my time is approaching to the end, to summarize, albeit these studies um, address different topics, um, they use different types of data, administrative register data, survey data, 
individual biographical data, they apply different analytical approaches and methods. And there are still some common denominators. They all in some way illustrate uh, what I referred to earlier, that the treatment uh, with um, seemingly same policies uh, do have a diverse response across the affected population. For me, these uh, studies also demonstrate that at times there are forces shaping the lives of people which are stronger than any single policy interventions. Social policies, social protection policies among them do have an impact. They do make a difference in the lives of people and for the population as a whole. However, they are not all powerful. Thank you. And I'm now open to questions. Thank you very much. And first I give word to the experts. Yes, Stephen, please. Yeah, very good. Hello, uh, Laurie. Thank you very much for your very interesting talk, particularly the, the last stuff. Um, I'm going to step back and ask a rather more general question um, about the sorts of things you do. I, I'm very intrigued by your career trajectory, having worked as a uh, primarily a social work academic, it seems, and, and then since 2014 been a full-time researcher. And yet now you want to return to a more straight up and down academic job with a variety of tasks. So I, I'd be really interested to hear what motiv motivates you to make this return transition and perhaps more importantly given this transition what sort of adjustments you would make what, what what would you bring in particular how would your research agenda be modified change and so on hmm. um, yes well indeed i have um, had a quite long history of of um, of teaching um, and um, I did not refer to this uh, in, in my presentation, but um, I have had this experience uh, um, and it has, um, it has an appeal. So um, to work with students, um, um, they always, um, in a way, they, they bring you um, closer to the to, to the real life with their um, with their cases and, and examples. Uh, um, so there is quite uh, enjoyable and and enriching uh, part uh, in 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 this. Um, so I still do teach, and and I have to say that I also enjoy. But you correctly pointed out that I have had a quite mixed uh, career. Uh, I have worked in the administration, I have worked as an academic, uh, I have worked as, as a researcher. Um, so um, there, um, there is an element of, of each, uh, uh, of all these backgrounds in, in me. Um, so it's, um, and um, at least for, for, for myself, I, I feel that they are in, in a certain balance and, and harmony, uh, even though at different time periods, uh, some aspects have, have taken prevalence. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And Corey, do you have any questions? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for interesting presentation. And of course, for Rafina, I, I found this last, last uh, study especially interesting. So, so surely we'll, we'll print it after this these lectures and, and read it this evening more detailed. But I have just, uh, just a question about this pension age that in, you, you mentioned that this pension age is for females, that is it the same for males in Estonia? Mm -hmm. um, because I, I know that in, in some Eastern European countries, there may be difference in mm -hmm. pension age between males and females, but I don't just know that is the, same situation is Estonia. Well, um, in Estonia, indeed, historically, mm, the ages were different. Um, 
but they were equalized uh, in 2016. And for the time being, um, the, the pension age for men and women is, is equal at the level of, of 64 years. Yes. But uh, at the time um, of, of, the, of the time period of, of, of this study to which I, I referred, we had a situation where the pension age for men was stable, but uh, it was increased for women just to bring them equal. Okay. So this was the setting where the study was, was undertaken. So, uh, and that was the reason why we, we, why we focused on, on, on women only, because for men, the pension age was, was not changing and, and for me, for female, it was increasing to, to reach the level uh, of, of men. Yes, just, just follow up this, this question that because this is a very hot topic in, in Finnish society as well, that what is your estimation that what will happen to pension age that we speculate in Finland that it may be increased to 70 years within a couple of next decades. Do you have any, any idea that what, what is going to happen in Estonia? Mm -hmm. Well, um, Estonia um, adopted um, a policy decision uh, in 2019 that um, the pension age will be linked to advances in life expectancy post-2026. So, um, so any further increases in pension age after 2026 will be automatically linked to advances in life expectancy, which uh, in other words is to say that, um, that the average period um, of in retirement uh, for, for cohorts retiring uh, after 2026 will be, will be the same. So um, uh, these, Mm -hmm. Advances in life expectancy will will postpone, respectively, the statutory pension age. Yes, so there is a link between increase in life expectancy and pension age, just like we have in Finland. Yes, yeah. thank you very much. So, thank you. Any other questions or comments, please? Yeah, Koido. Yes, uh, hello, thank you. I would like to ask uh, a question from a perspective of a research coordinator in our school that, uh, that, uh, that the Nord Professorship has a really uh, a very, very important uh, mission to fulfill uh, in the future, to create research groups and attract uh, research fundings and so on. How do you see from where to start uh, as a tenure professor uh, to cre create this new generation of uh, school of uh, new uh, young researchers uh, under this topic? Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I have to admit that uh, that uh, it is um, a new professorship uh, and um, I made some hints in, in my presentation um, suggesting that it will be a tricky professorship because uh, um, it is um, interdisciplinary uh, covering then different uh, domains. Um, in, my, uh, in my plans, which I um, indicated um, when, when writing this application, I um, gave some indications. Um, uh, one of the tricks is, is that, um, that um, social work or social protection studies, uh, which have been uh, which have uh, had a history at Tallinn University and uh, the population studies um, that they have um, had quite um, quite distinct um, um, sort of approaches. <clears> that there is firstly the difference between the the analytical methods uh, used 
demography has been more um, quantitative and, and social work studies have been more, more qualitative. <clears throat> Most of, of uh, social work master students write their theses uh, on, uh, on, on qualitative, um, uh, using qualitative methods. Um, and a rather small minority of them then use quantitative methods. But um, I hope uh, that uh, there is a possibility to, uh, to, um, to bring these two domains closer. Mm -hmm. um, and both, from both angles, <clears throat> firstly, uh, <clears throat> I believe that there is, um, for, for master students uh, in social work, uh, a prospect to um, write uh, their master works or, or thesis on, on <clears throat> topics related to um, population studies, but um, possibly applying then qualitative methods or <clears throat> mixed uh, methods. And um, so that there, I hope that there is a scope for some uh, more qualitative studies in, in demography, <laughs> which may be of interest to, to social work um, students. And, um, and then um, possibly also from, from, from other angles. Indeed, there is a challenge to, uh, to apply um, for research funding uh, from, from other sources. Uh, uh, my, my own experience um, uh, indicates that um, sometimes it is easier to, or has been easier to apply for, for funding uh, from outside Estonia than, than from Estonia. Uh, because the, the Estonia research funding is, is highly competitive um, and there are many research groups which, uh, which um, are of very high quality and this is to be recognized. Okay, thank you very much.